Welcome to the Leadership of Vision podcast by Austin Gardner. For more information and resources, visit worldevangelism.net. Well, I'd like to welcome you to Leadership with Vision. I'm here with Jeff Bush, the Director of Vision Baptist Missions. Uh, I'm not sure, but even uh, Trent Cornwell may pipe in here in just a minute. He is in the studio, which is nothing more than my uh, table, dining room table in the house, and he's over helping my grandson. Uh, and we heard from a, a friend uh, named Eric. Uh, he called Jeff. Jeff, uh, you don't have to give last names or anything. I don't know how much privacy the guy wanted, but what, uh, what did he have to say? Well, uh, greetings, my friend Eric. He's in Dominican Republic and um, working in the ministry there. And he told us that he was listening, uh, chiming in. He said he a lot of the stories made a lot of sense to him. He even laughed at some of them. So I appreciate you listening, Eric. And I hope there's other people out there that are listening. And maybe this will be a blessing and a help to you. And we would love to hear from you. Uh, uh, Eric contacted Jeff directly. That's a blessing. You can leave messages for us on worldevangelism.net. You can email us. Contact us any way you can. We'd love to hear from you. Well, we've been talking about crossing the cultural divide, and that's where we're going to go back to today. And uh, I know you know the word sympathy, but there's another word called empathy. And empathy is a crucial attitude that will allow the missionary to truly enter into the lives and feelings of the people as an equal and as a friend. So we want to practice empathy. We're going to talk to you just briefly about what that means as you work with the people on the field. But basically, summing it up is you want to move out. of It's not sympathy. You're not feeling sorry for them. It is that you are joining into their feelings, living amongst them, understanding what's happening, trying to become one of them. In other words, you don't have pity for the people, looking at them like, all oh, these poor people, they'll never go anywhere in life. It's not really the pity. It's kind of putting yourself in their shoes. So you're, you're thinking about them. You're thinking, if I was in their situation, this is how I'd think. This is what I would do. And you treat them, that golden rule of treating others how you yourself want to be treated. And you know, the problem is you're not going to do this until you learn the language. You're not going to do this until you really start getting in the culture, which means you're going to have to eat the food, spend a lot of time with them, and really get amongst them and learn to be a part of them. And that's your goal for these first two years that you have on the mission field is to be a part of them. The only way to achieve this is to pray for it. Uh, it's not something that you necessarily can do by yourself, but the Holy Spirit of God can love through you. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. you got to remember that God has placed you there on the mission field as the spiritual leader. You're the guide. You're the one who's taking the Word of God and leading the front of the group to uh, to get the job done. So God is using you. And a lot of times, sadly, missionaries can have the um, nationalistic or the, the racist attitude of, I'm an American, I'm a little bit better. No, God can use them just as well as he can use you, actually. The correct term that we use for that is called paternalism. It's the great white father syndrome. It is, I'm superior to you. I come from a better country. I have a better church. I'm a better person. My nation's a better people. It is just a strong manifestation of pride. And uh, when you have that, you actually lower the other person and you stop them from developing. You are acting like you are the big daddy and they're your kid. And so you have this attitude that just smothers the believers. Instead of helping them feel like God can use me, uh, you treat them like they're kids and you are the almighty. When I was still in the country of Argentina, a group of missionaries got together and I remember sitting in the living room of one of the missionaries, very kind people. But as I was sitting there, I remember them talking about, um, you know, the people here in this country, they will never learn. The only way they can really learn or the only way they'll ever become successful is if we send them back to America so that they can go to an American college. Man, it ate me up. And the idea that only America or the idea that only our teachers or our kind can really teach these people, man, that'll kill. There is no great white father, the great paternal as Pastor was saying, that stuff can't exist. You have to believe that God can use them. You have to put yourself right with them and and love those people, God's put them in your life for a specific reason. You have the attitude of they must go back to America or even our school must be recognized by an American school to give it some real meaning and without meaning to do so, you have become a paternalistic. Uh, They can never do it as well as us. Uh, They will never be able to do the ministry and you are lifting yourself up. You're putting yourself way above everybody else and you are are demeaning them. Uh, You often demean their language. You demean uh, their personality. You demean their abilities. I remember when I first arrived in Peru, a senior missionary gave me material to read using the TEE, Theological Education by Extension idea, 
which is basically like ACE for extension or ACE for Bible college. And uh, in the book that we read, it stated very simply, you'll never get these people. If you can get a Peruvian to a high school Sunday school teacher's level or a high school Sunday school student level. So basically we want to turn Peruvians into uh, high school teenagers in American churches. And that was about as much Bible knowledge and walk with God as they were ever going to develop. And I will be honest with you, that is the most utterly ridiculous thing I have ever heard. If you, uh, And by the way, people only rise to what you expect of them. Uh, you find what you're looking for and you get what you honor. And so that, the idea that these people will never be as good as us is ridiculous. You know, uh, last night, just coincidentally, Pastor, I just finished the book, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And it hurt me so bad about thinking, you know, the the wickedness of what was happening in uh, the United States. I don't mean to get off track, but, you know, it's comparable, I believe, because the wickedness of the United States when the, the slavery was going on, the, the black people would say, how in the world could the whites use slavery and say the law is on their side and the Bible is on their side? And, you know, we look at that and we say that's a wicked thing. But many times in one, I guess one sense, one level, you know, mission work can be the same way because an American would walk in and we say we are better than them. We do know more than them. The Bible teaches us this and it almost becomes where they're less. They're not as important or not as valuable. And that is not true at all. God wants to use them. God can use them. Maybe we need to fix our own attitude. Maybe we need to see in them that there is much more. They can do much more. And God wants to do something special in them. So if I can change my attitude, if I get that out of my mind, then you know what? I can see them in a different aspect and I can start treating them in a different way. And I can look at them in a different way. And so that I can begin to prepare them for the ministry. We must remember we're unworthy servants and that all all we have is of God. Everything I have, God gave me. He didn't make me better than anybody else. I am merely a beggar showing other beggars where to find bread. And if I get that attitude, paternalism will disappear. God will make people in your mission field who will arrive, they will rise to your level spiritually. They will. They can rise to your levels uh, in knowledge. They can rise to your level in doing the ministry. Don't you dare think otherwise. You just represent Jesus Christ. You're not there as an advocate of your home culture. You do not go to the foreign field to set up little Americas. You're not going to spread who we are as Americans. You're going to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you must get that straight in your heart. And I'll be quite honest, Pastor, I know you've seen this in Peru and different places you've traveled all over. But I know many times it seems like on the mission field, many times there's more of a commitment to serve Christ from those people than there is actually from from Americans. And I think, you know, we could see that. They're, they have less money and less opportunities, yet they have a greater commitment and really want to serve God more than we do. I have seen, Jesus. Pat, and you have too, we've seen national pastors with more commitment than missionaries. I've known missionaries that don't even go to church. I've known missionaries that don't go soul winning. I've known missionaries that don't share the gospel. I've known missionaries that preach only warmed over messages and they're not really doing the job they're called to do. And so the idea that the national won't do more than that is just ridiculous. You know, the flip side of it, is that's where uh, this attitude comes from. And sadly, I've seen some of this, but there are people in other countries who hate Americans. They're, they're pastors and uh, church leaders, and they hate American missionaries because they say they have so much money. And, they, and we actually give them a reason to hate us. We've actually kind of formed that. I remember I took a trip many years ago, uh, actually with you, Pastor. We went to Venezuela, and we sat down, and there was a man from the church, and he said um, that, you know, I will respect my pastor. We, you were kind of middlemanning it. And he said, I will respect that missionary when he starts, he preaches about tithing and I never see him give anything in the plate. And he preaches about going out and he tells me always to go out and he never does it himself. And uh, you know, can I just tell you some missionaries have begun to use the people just as a way to keep the money flowing to them. You'd be surprised at the number of missionaries who have actually gone in a room and uh, filmed uh, for for gospel films. They've made a film of a guy being witnessed to who uh, had no interest in it and they pretended he got saved, pretended he went to church, pretended something happened. And you watch the video in America and you're like, wow, that's really great. But the people on the field are like that was so much craziness. I've actually seen missionaries go in and say, uh, I want to take pictures of me witnessing, discipling, and preaching in your church because I need my I need them for my slideshow when I get back home. I've known of a missionary who is literally hated by the nationals who was physically removed from a church because they knew he took pictures in that church uh, just so he'd have something to show back home when he never did anything. He didn't give, he didn't attend, he did nothing more than take pictures. And so if you're using them to make 
money, they will soon realize you have that superior, take advantage attitude towards them. You know, I guess a test could kind of be not necessarily what other Americans think of you as a missionary because of your prayer letters or because your blogs or your reports back. Not really what they think, but what do the actual people think of you as a missionary? That could be a big test. And if they know that you truly are a man of character, a man who loves them, a man who cares about them, will do anything for them, I think that that's probably should be your goal, not worrying about what everybody else thinks. Remember, we've got to avoid the attitude that communicates the feeling that the way we do things back home is the right way and the proper way whatever it is. And so the, they don't need to hear about your home country. They don't. If you're going to move there, stop talking about your country that sent you. Don't mention the United States. Don't defend the United States. Tell them you're a citizen of another country, a citizen of heaven. Your mayor is Jesus. Your constitution is the word of God. And you are not there to promote anything about your home country. Do we really want to promote the United States of America? Do we really think that our country is somehow a place where abortions don't take place, a place where homosexuality isn't rampant in the street, a place where pedophilia is not there? The truth is that I am often embarrassed about the sinfulness of America. I'm not going anywhere to promote that. I'm going somewhere to promote the teaching and the preaching of the of the Word of God, and I'm going somewhere to lift up Jesus and make much of Him. You know, I feel like saying amen right there. <laughs> That's good stuff. You know, we, while we go out there, we're not to treat their church, their people, uh, the pastors. Any, don't treat them any differently than you would in the United States. Uh, you know, be careful. They are just as good, many times even more spiritual than a church, than Christians in the United States. So remember, you've got two big mistakes that you could have. You could be big daddy, white, white American, great, great white father missionary, paternalistic. Or you could spoil them and go to the other side and just give them money and never correct them and never teach them. And that's the problem. You've got to walk this fine line between the two. Don't treat them like spoiled children. Speak the truth to them in love. Have a natural respect based on a mutual understanding. Don't pamper. Don't patronize. Uh, They are equal. Just treat them naturally like you would another brother. They are really just people. They really are just people. You don't have to act like they're not people. And uh, you're going to work at getting, see, this is crossing that cultural divide. This is what you're accomplishing in that first two years so that you will be able to do ministry among them. So uh, I'd like to move now to some do's and don'ts in their church, which Jeff's already mentioned at least one. I guess everything we've been talking about is some of that, but let's just go over some really basic stuff that we would tell any visiting group that came to America or came to, excuse me, came to Peru when I was there. I would tell them this. I went over this with them. And so I would like to go over some of that with you. Okay. I I guess we could start. I kind of mentioned a little bit, uh, Pastor, about not treating the church people differently, uh, the pastors, but I know I have seen personally where an American young person comes down, a group, a youth group, or whoever comes down, they visit, and because the color of the skin or the language is different with one of our pastors, they'll well, look the at them. Building, well, the church building is nice. Yeah, it's got metal on the roof, and it's just made out of wood or, you know, a dirt floor or whatever. Then all of a sudden, the American looks at them, they're, um, okay, pastor, and they, they talk to them almost like you would talk to a kid. You know, I mean, it's horrible. And I'm thinking, this man has suffered more for the Lord. He's given up. I have seen men who've been, you know, kicked out of their house because they want to serve God and their family rejects them. They have suffered more. They have sacrificed more. They've loved more. They're more committed. And you have no right to treat them as less than an American pastor just because he doesn't have a vehicle or he doesn't, you know, speak your language or he's a different color or whatever it may be. So be very careful. I think something that ends up happening on on, on that thing is you're a missionary and in America, you would treat a pastor of 20 with respect. And if you don't, you won't raise your support. And yet you go to the mission field and this guy is running 20 or 50 or 100 and you are rude and crude to him. Uh, I talked to a missionary one time and uh, he had uh, been rude to this missionary or this pastor. He pastored 200 people and uh, they were working at a camp and uh, they've been working all day for free, all the pastors and some members and the, the, the senior, this pastor of the largest church in town stood up and he said, uh, he made the comment, I'm tired, I'm going to go jump in the ocean, cool off a little bit and I'm going home. 
And uh, the missionary, who was younger than him, said, you're not going home. You made an agreement. You've got to be a man of your word. You're not going home. You're going to do what you, uh, what you committed to do. And the pastor said, I am going home, and you're not going to stop me. And the missionary just started uh, the mistreating him and disciplining him in front of everybody right there on the scene. And so the guy left, and all the other pastors got up and left with him. And the missionary told me later, I don't understand why they would do that. And at that time, this, this uh, missionary's pastor was Tim Lay, and uh, his church was massively large in Southern California. And I said, would you talk like that to Tim LaHaye? And he said, of course I would. And I said, no, you wouldn't. You're lying to yourself. Why would you treat the pastor of the largest church in town like he was your errand boy? You do that, you will destroy your relationship. Don't treat them like that. You know, it's so easy because uh, an American has more money. You know, even a, even a group of young people who would come down, they have more money, so automatically we think that we're better. Or, you know, now we just can't in a van. We just got on an airplane. And so we're automatically better than that pastor. That pastor, like you said, he can run way more people, be much more successful, be much more committed. But because you have it better in comforts of life, then we don't look at him the same and we don't treat him the same. We almost have, you know, going right back to where we started. We don't, we almost have pity on the guy instead of the empathy for the man, instead of understanding where they're at and what they're doing. So be very careful, you know, just the simple fact, you know, we spoke about it before pastor on, on previous podcasts, but just the fact of, you know, running out and going next door to where I have a little uh, tienda or kiosco, a little bitty store right next to it and buying a Coke and coming in there and talking to the pastor. This man who has a couple hundred people or he loves God and you, you've not even started a Sunday school class and you walk in there with a Coke and eat, eating or drinking right in front of them. That's just rude in which, culture. Which in most cultures, you invite. In most cultures, you offer what you have. So I would never buy or uh, I would not buy, get myself a Coke. And by the way, if you were in my home right here in America, uh, when Jeff got here this morning, I was drinking coffee and my wife offered him a cup of coffee. It would have been quite rude for me to get up and go get me a, a Coke out of the refrigerator and come back in and not offer him a Coke. Is that true of American culture or not? I believe it's definitely true. And uh, so why would you do that overseas? And especially in a country where the people have almost no money and yet you and your kids are eating and drinking in front of them and, and so that they become um, jealous and they wish they could have that stuff. You know, um, on the same on the same line, you kind of mentioned before about you know, talking about America. I've seen young people who come in uh, visiting our field. We did have this one young lady she visited. She was a good girl, but somebody asked her, so do you, what do you think about our country? She said, oh, it's okay. And man, I was cringing. I was standing over to the side and they said, do you like our country um, as much as you like America? And of course, someone was translating for her, broken down English. And uh, she said, no, I actually like the United States way better because, and she started giving her a list. And I thought, Lord have mercy. They, <laughs> they took everything she said. Oh, she might've been honest in her mind. And later I talked to her, I said, why in the world did you say that? She said, well, I wasn't going to lie to him. And I said, well, you don't have to say it like that. That's horrible. You know, it's almost like you're flaunting what you have, whether it's food in front of them, or I come from a richer place, or I have all these different things. Don't do that. You're on their territory. So abide by their rules. Learn from them. Watch them. Ask the missionary. And missionaries, you know, watch the people and ask them. You don't want to hurt them. You want to love them. You want to get in with them. You want to learn about their culture and and know what's going on in their lives. Don't constantly criticize their country and don't talk about your country being better. Don't talk about how you miss being in your country. Don't talk about how your country is better. Well, there's two more things that I want us to mention. Uh, one, if you have somebody working in your house, keeping your children or helping you, and often in some of these foreign countries, it is custom and everybody will, and you'll need one because of the ministry and all the things. You need to remember that that person who works in your house is a loudspeaker to everyone outside of your home. And so if they see or hear you saying things in your home, they will go out and say, this is what he really thinks. This is, you're leading a double life and they will tell everybody. You know, I guess, um, let me throw one more in real quick, Pastor. I would say for a missionary, for somebody who's going to work in that country, is to develop a taste for their food. The food of where you're at. And, and let's be honest, all of us grew up in, in different circumstances. We all have a taste for something. But when you arrive on that mission field, whatever they serve you, I think the Apostle Paul straight out said it. You know I mean? Just, hey, they put something down there. Just eat it. And for conscious sake, don't ask about it, I think is what 1 Corinthians says. So 
develop a taste for their food. Eat with them. Don't turn your nose up at their food. You, you know, you reject their food, you reject the culture, you reject the culture, you reject the people. You don't want that. So you'll have to learn. In Argentina, about every time they'll eat an asado, which would be a grill, they eat, um, most all the time, they'll eat chinchulines, which are intestines. And at first, when I got down there, just the thought of watching them cut the intestines and have my thought, Lord have mercy, I don't want to eat these things. They're horrible. And I remember even asking, I mean, some of them have gray matter inside of it. And I, I asked one of the men, I said, what, uh, what? What is this? And he said, it's just the grease. And I said, but did they clean it? You know, I was like, you got to be kidding. You know what these things are and what goes through this. It was horrible. But you know, after a while eating them so many times, it, it you know, might seem pretty gross to my friends who are listening, but they're actually not that bad. And I acquired a taste for them. There's other things that I don't exactly, and I'd rather avoid, but almost develop a taste for the foods there. Because if you can like their food and if you can talk good about it, and if you can say, Hey man, this is one of my favorite. This is what I really like and acquire something for where they're at. It's almost like, Hey, you like our food? Yeah, man. I love it. It's almost like now you're one of us. That's right. I think that's exactly right. And you know, you'll develop a taste for it. And all of a sudden you'll be like, I really like that because most everything has an acquired taste. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've uh, uh, something that's worthwhile, something you can place in your uh, ministry. And I would hope that you'd be in touch with us. Thank you, Eric, for contacting Jeff. What a privilege. Uh, feel free to email us. You can email me at wagardner at gmail.com. You can email Jeff at? At bush at visionmissions.com. And we would love to hear from you. And uh, thank you for what you're doing in the ministry. And we look forward to talking to you next time. Please share this with somebody. Tell others about it. We would love to hear from you and love to have more people listening to this. You've been listening to Leadership with Vision by Austin Gardner. Visit worldevangelism.net to discover more podcasts and useful articles.